Welcome to Business Coaching Secrets with Carl Bryan. If you want to attract new high-end coaching clients, fill live events, and build a wildly profitable coaching practice where business owners pay, stay, and refer, you've come to the right place. In this podcast, Carl provides his keys to the kingdom for finding and signing high-paying clients and building the coaching business of your dreams. Here we go. Let's rock and roll. So I'm going to start off you're talking about, uh, you know, like, let's, I'm just looking, we're looking at this picture right here of, of your daughter in front of your house. And obviously last weekend in our neighborhood, for those of you that don't know, Carl and I live about two blocks apart. We have this massive community garage sale. It's unbelievable. We get like 6,000 people come up to our neighborhood. It's insane. But what does Carl do? He puts his daughter to work and, uh, and, and gets her to do a lemonade stand. So how, how did that all work out for you guys? Uh, she outsold the garage sale. Let's put it that way. Not bad. <laughs> so what? What happened? Why was? Were you just like uh, giving her sales scripts, or what was going on there? <laughs> yeah, I got I got Adrian to do some scripts for her. I provided them to her and her best little buddy that were there. No, look, look, the way it started. You know what? Very innocently, bought her a uh, a book. Which, by the way, I saw you know flipping through Facebook, and you know a guy, another fellow business guy, you know, follow him, yeti yeti yeti. He's got his daughter with this series of books. So it's Charlie and the fruit stand. I don't know if that's well, this particular book. I think Charlie is the, the character and it's Charlie and the fruit stand. So I read, you know, Sage before she goes to bed, right? Read to her every night. And this, you know, we read this book, you know, multiple times and she ranks them by the way, they get a two thumbs up, a thumbs up, a thumb to the side and then thumb down. Right. So this was a double thumb up. So we read it multiple times and then she got fired up to do a lemonade stand. So I said, Oh, you know, we got that grad sale. If you want, we'll, you know, we'll set it up there. So first thing, so sent my wife because I had heard about, um, you know, the fact that we, you know, like there's, you see the picture of the lemonade stand there, right? So I knew about that at a, uh, at an event. So we, you know, we got that. She colored it. She did all of that herself with a couple of her buddies. Um, the chalk, well, actually, okay. So anyway, so we got her fired up. We got that. Now what we did is we watched YouTube videos on ideas in and around lemonade stands. And if you guys know my personality, that wouldn't surprise you. But I can tell you that if you ask me to undertake marketing for any business, a dentist, a doctor, a chiropractor, a butcher, baker, candlestick maker, the first thing that I would do is go into research. So I thought, well, let's go into research for the lemonade stand, watch, you know, read some, um, watch some videos. And we honestly, like I was watching it and she learned a lot. There's no doubt that was the idea. But I got to tell you, by watching it, I was thinking, well, there's some things that I haven't thought of. You know, we had the chalkboard set up with the prices. Um, she offered chocolate chip cookies and brownies as well. She had icy cold water, as she calls it, um, for the parents. Because, again, the parents don't really want the lemonade, but they want the water. So, again, it was good. We had popsicles for those that don't like lemonade. She offered delivery. Okay, so basically, and then the delivery... It was a grad sale, so everybody's floating through, but you've got parents, you know, that are hanging out in a pretty, it's a pretty sunny day. So she offered delivery. So she got on her bike and then she could, you know, cover a higher level, you know, like a higher distance. So her and her buddy, well, she also had her buddy come do it. So that gave her a little bit more confidence. Her buddy's not in the photo, but her buddy was there as well. Um, so a few other, so the delivery was a big one, but again, so we're, we're doing delivery to the other folks that had the, uh, the stores, but I got to tell you, she blitzed it. And then when somebody came and got a lemonade, because that was far and away the most popular order, the fact that it's a lemonade stand would make sense. But she would say, and I was so proud of her, she did it a few times, you know, it wasn't like she was, uh, you know, she said, do you want, would you like a cookie or brownie as well? <laughs> right? So the old, do you want fries with that? So she murdered and she made $81 in the, uh, in the garage sale. So there you go. And she's pretty pressed. In fact, she did it again. And uh, since then, so we went down. In fact, I asked her this question, and again, it's kind of hilarious, but I say to her, Sage, okay, so it's the summer. If we were to set up a little store to sell something, would we sell hot chocolate and coffee, or would we sell lemonade and popsicles? And she goes, lemonade and popsicles. And then I say, why? And she goes, well, because it's hot. I go, exactly. And I go, where do we set up? Should we set up at the end of our street, which we live in a cul-de-sac, right? So should we set at the end of our street? Or should we set up at the beach? 
And then she goes, the beach. And then I'll say why. And she goes, because there's lots of people. And I go, exactly. I go, well, in six months time, it's going to be winter time. So should we set up at the end of our driveway or should we set up at Big White, which is the mountains, a world-class mountain an, an hour away? And she says at Big White. And I say, why? She goes, that's where all the people are. And I say, well, when we're at Big White and we set up in six months, should we sell lemonade and popsicles or should we sell um, ice cream and, or sorry, should we sell hot chocolate and coffee? And she says hot chocolate and coffee. And I say, why? She says, because it's going to be cold, right? So what am I getting at? Basic business principles, right? I ask her the question. Of course, she didn't get them the first time I asked. And then I explained them to her. And now we, we do it all the time. And it's a little bit of a running joke, right? So very basic principles for a lemonade stand. My daughter managed to make $81. She didn't do the delivery. If she didn't do the upsells, um, you know, if she didn't do that, she didn't have the extra added um, you know, the brownies and the cookies and not just lemonade. And if she left out the popsicles and if she left out um, the water, which are just natural things that people are going to want on a hot day, she wouldn't have done nearly as well. So basically, look, she's five years old, man. She knocked it out of the park. And uh, my message for everyone is that it's just not that hard, but you got to, um, you know, you got to make it happen. So there you go. So there's the story behind the uh, Sage's Lemonade Stand. That uh, is legendary. Love it. So now getting into some serious questions, but sort of, I guess, you know, we're, we're talking about coaching and, and, uh, and doing the work. So what, what do you think are the three must haves when you're, when you're hiring a coach? Okay. So okay, three must haves. So you mean for the coaching client, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So I would just say this. People are hopeless. The reason, Okay, you guys take on a coaching client. We take on coaching clients. Most certainly I've had this. And then you find that you lose the client in 90 days. And it's like nothing gets done. Nothing gets accomplished. They never show up. And they get overwhelmed at, you know, the, the sight of a mouse, right? What's the reason why? Is it they're hopelessly disorganized where they're at? And it's that old Uber metaphor. You guys have you've heard me probably say it before. You'll most certainly hear me say it again. Uber metaphor. These guys, Uber built a, whatever it is, a hundred billion plus plus um, dollar company um, on the back of two questions. Where are you? Where do you want to go? So when, when you're starting off with a coaching client, recognizing that there's a high probability that they're hopelessly unprepared for you, you've got to help them with those two things. If you don't know where they're at, if you don't, if you want to run a race against me, and I don't tell you where the start line is, nor the finish line. I got bad news for you. I'm going to kick your ass. End of story, right? Whether you're faster than me or not, it, this is not going to be a good result for you on average, right? So you got to help them do that, which is the absolute stinking fundamentals, right? And then it's like, well, what are some areas of their business where you could help them, you know, kind of create these guidelines, create these start lines? Like, you know, the number of leads that they get per week or per month, my guess is that if you call the average business in your community right now, the chances of them being able to spit out the number of leads that they got last week, actually, there's a chance they could because the number will be friggin' zero, right? Because they're not doing any of it, any promotion. But there's no chance that they will be able to tell you um, the number of leads that came in last week. Okay, well, this is something that I would nail down. What about their revenues? Again, work out, you know, what are they bringing in per week, per month, per quarter, per annum? Again, there's a high probability they don't know what those things are. Their expenses, I would, you guys, first thing I do with a lot of coaching clients is sit down with them, go through their credit card statements. Why are you doing that? If you charge $2,000 a month, that's twenty four grand a year, there's a ridiculously good chance that you will be able to find the $24,000 in savings just by going through their credit card statements because they haven't done it in like real, probably like good chance three years. I'd almost bet anything that it's been like the last six months or last 12 months. They haven't gone there through their expenses and, um, and critique them. They've gone through their credit card statements and whatnot, but I'm talking from a position of critical, critical viewpoint where they're taking a red pen and, you know, isolating expenses that they can just put a line through entirely. And then there's also a lot of expenses that can be negotiated, that can be worked on. Like you got a hair salon, you walk in, they've got six different labels 
of shame. Like, you know, they have, sh- you know, there's a pretty girl standing at the, the front counter and behind her, there's a retail space. You look at it, they got all different types of labels, right? Shampoo, conditioner, gel, wax, whatever. If they've got six different labels, that means they've got six different deliveries, six different distributors, um, six different phone calls, six different invoices. You know, if they're only making a few hundred grand a year, this is ridiculous. Why don't they buy from one, show some loyalty, buy in bulk, take advantage of a discount, right? If they've got the capacity to pay up front for their invoice, they'll normally get 5 to 7% off if they pay up front. We'll take advantage of that discount because it's going to increase their margins instantly without them having to make sales and whatnot. Because the business I'm talking about, say a hair salon, I mean, I don't need to be introduced to them to know that there's a, probably a really good chance that the owner makes between 60 and 120 grand per year. Well, if you just wipe out the expenses, that money, you know, there's a really good chance that that goes straight to their bottom line. And you just took them from 60 to 120 to 80 to 150 without doing anything, right? But they need you there. Where are they at? Where do they want to get to? Help them critique this stuff. But they don't know where they're at. They don't know where the starting line is. And again, if you run a race, if we jump in the pool, we jump in the ocean, and we're going to have a swimming race, and I don't tell you where the start and finish line, the same thing goes, I'm going to kick your butt whether I'm an inferior um, swimmer or not, right? Also, there are conversions. Um, you know, like, how are they going about converting? So if, if I ask the average business owner, what are your conversions, <laughs> right? You hear, I guess you hear it all the time, 80%. I've heard 100%, right? The, the chances of them having a 100% conversion, let me tell you, okay? You just tell them, if your conversions are 100%, I'll pull down my pants and I will run around the neighborhood naked for all to see, right? Because good news, you're not going to have to pull down your pants because there's no chance that they have a 100% conversion, but they are that lost, right? They are that out to lunch, even when they say 80%. When you do the numbers, you are going to find they're a whole lot closer to 25% than they are 75%. But they never measure these numbers, therefore they don't know where they're at. This is why these coaching clients get so overwhelmed so quickly. You know, So, so their conversions, unit of sale. So on the average sale that they make, I mean, you can even ask realtors this question. And they can't give you an answer. And I got to tell you that, you know, a realtor makes, you know, 10 sales a year. They're doing pretty well. If you only made 10 sales a year, you should probably know what your average unit of sale is, but they don't, right? So helping them with that. And then, by the way, like my daughter with the lemonade stand, so, you know, lemonade was a dollar. Um, I think cookies were a dollar, whatever it was. But, okay, so let's say cookies are a dollar, brownies are a dollar, and lemonade's a buck. If you come in and order a lemonade, it's one dollar. If you add a brownie, it goes to two, okay, and you double her unit of sale. Okay, you follow that? Oh, what's that noise there, buddy? Okay, so basically you're doubling her unit of sale. Okay, so this is a good thing. Even if you add 30, 40 percent, like you double the profitability of the business or actually that individual um, sale. When you add a cookie, like when you take one and turn it into two, they are not using things like upsells. Like they've got a hair salon. They should be selling shampoo and conditioner, but they say that they're not and their clients don't want it. The reason why is because the hair, you know, the hairstylist is sitting there. She's got them in. They got you for 30 minutes. Okay. They got to talk about something. Actually, you don't have to talk about anything, but if they want a good, good tip, probably a good idea to start a conversation with you. And one of the things they can talk about is the quality, you know, like your hair is thin, your hair is thick, your hair is this, your hair is that, you're losing a few hairs, whatever. Be careful with that because the guy doesn't want to talk about the fact that he's losing his hair, right? But you go through, so then there's a particular shampoo, a particular gel, a particular something that they should be doing with their hair. I got really thick hair. So there's like a conditioning treatment that would be really good for my hair as an example. Obvious, and by the way, this is going to work significantly better for the ladies than it is the men. But, you know, if you turn a $100 haircut into a $150 haircut, when you do your math at the end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year, your numbers are going to be through the friggin' roof. But they don't measure this stuff, so therefore it doesn't increase. Repeat business. How often do people come and see you? You own a restaurant, and it's like, how often do these people come back? Okay, and here's a great strategy. If people on average, they come in, let's say they come in once a month to your restaurant, 
well, everybody leaves with a coupon, like a, call it a coupon, but basically a, um, yeah, a coupon that says if you come in within the 14 days, right, within 14 days and has an expiry date, you get a free entree, you get a free dessert, you get a free bottle of wine. Well, you got to be careful with alcohol. But bottom line is you get a free dinner if you come within 14 days. Do you know many people that go to dinner by themselves? I don't know many, right? Or kids eat for free, you know, kids eat for free if you come within 14 days, right? Well, they come in. If you got four people at the table and one is free, when you do your math at the end of the night, believe me, it's not a big deal, but you got them in sooner. So that would be an example of something you could use in a restaurant to increase the, the repetition of your business. But if you're not measuring it, you're not going to know where the heck it is. And profit margins, talked about that a little bit a second ago there with the hair salon. You, here's the magic of, of profit margins. You have a business that made $100,000 last year. They have 20% margins. Again, when I ask them, they're going to tell me they have 50% margins. When we do the math, we're going to say, you know, see that they're significantly tighter than that. But they got 20% margins. We sit down with their credit card statements. We take advantage of discounts. We show loyalty to suppliers so that we get taken advantage of and lots of freebies and samples and that sort of thing. The bottom line is that we are going to find a way to get their margins from 20 to 30%. They made 100 grand a minute ago. On the surface, that appears to be a 10% increase, but it is not. It's a 50% increase because a 10% increase would be from 20 to 22 a 20% increase would be 20 to 24, a 30% would be 20 to 26. So when you go from 20 to 30% increase in their margins, which is normally insanely easy to do, and you do it in 45 days falling off a log with some intestinal fortitude and a little bit of effort, you just made them $50,000. You charge two grand a month, that's 24 grand a year. They've made over, like a, they've doubled your coaching fees in the first 12 months without making a sale. So, so Road Dog, that would be an example. So I would just come back to the must-haves. They've got to ha you got to have some barometers. You, ha you have to create some starting lines, and then that way you can create a little bit of excitement. I mean, even setting something up like a goal. Again, I don't need to meet them to know that they don't have their goals written down. Okay, so if it's going to be a, a goal, is always better framed um, in the eyes of your client, right? So like we coach coaches. Our goals are designed around the, the, the success and the earnings of our clients. That's always the best. But let's just say we have a new coach and at the end of the day, they've got to get their milestone up like 10 grand a month is what they have to earn. I would get that client to change the password on his phone to 10,000. Okay, because this way he's opening his phone 17, 18, 20 times a day. She's pumping that in 20 times a day to her phone. Uh, you know what I mean? It's top of mind at a higher level. It's not magic, but it's pretty close. But at the end of the day, remember, they didn't have the goal before you showed up. You got to help them with that. So Road Dog, that's what I would say, man. Help your clients get prepared um, for the coaching relationship early on. Super duper important, bud. That's awesome, dude. So, um, yeah, I apologize for any noise the effects that are happening here. Apparently, my phone's doing crazy things. Hey, uh, you talk about that, though, when it comes to seeing the numbers. I hear a lot of coaches say, but have you established the trust initially that quick? Can you address that? Okay, just exp what, expand on that a little bit for me. I'm not – what do you mean? So the trust with the client to be able to – get? Oh, okay, trust as in to be able to get them to divulge these numbers? Correct. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, look, this case, during the sales process, you got to make sure, um, like, yeah, you've got to build a lot of rapport. If you want to increase your conversions, if you want to increase the sales, increase um, your unit of sale and whatnot, you want to increase, you've got to increase the amount of rapport you build up with your client, not get better at closing. You follow me? So, like, through your sales process, you initially build rapport, and then ultimately you get to a close. And most sales training will help you and teach you how to close at a higher level and come up with better scripts and that sort of thing. The reality is that building a lot of rapport with somebody is um, going to get you significantly further than anything else. Um, so with that, you know, I'm just coaching my client. Look, you know, I need to open up. I got to be vulnerable a little bit myself, right? I have to, you know, ensure like, and, and by the way, this will help you with your conversions as well, which sometimes surprises you. But you know, admitting that you are not perfect. You know, it's like if you've ever seen a professional speaker, they get up there and one of the first things they do is tear themselves down. 
Well, it's very important because at the end of my talk, I want you to be thinking in your mind, if this idiot could pull this off, my gosh, surely I'd have a chance, right? What you don't want to be thinking is that, gee, yeah, but he's got a PhD. He's got an MBA. He's super smart. He went to school for eight years. He's, you know, was a dentist in a former life. So, of course, it's going to work for him because he's significantly smarter and, you know, more astute than I. So, it just comes back to build and rapport, Road Dog, and there's just, you know, there's, there's no magic pill for it. But I can tell you, showing vulnerability yourself um, is a is a magic way of doing that. And maybe, again, some people are a little bit more analytical and a little bit more cautious. So you need to be smart enough to be able to read that situation and read that client. And therefore, this person, I'm not going to ask them to, you know, whip out their financials in two seconds. But during the sales process, understand that I have to ask these questions because how can I help you get from A to B right. without having an understanding as to your finances and that sort of thing? So building rapport is an absolute huge one, and it's an art form, not a science, and one that you will only learn through practice. You know what else is an art form? Live calls. These are an art form. And uh, did you know that when you press the, the power button on your iPhone three times, it calls 911? So that was exciting. <laughs> Behind the scene, as 911 is calling me saying, are you under duress? <laughs> no, I'm good. So anyways, my phone is now powered off. because That was ridiculous. Oh, my God. Anyways, back on track. I'm just sweating over here, waiting for the cops to show up. So we had a question in, in, our, in our coaches group, um, which I thought was interesting, on the best way to approach the Chamber of Commerce. And I know you've got obviously a ton of experience with that. So what, what have you done in the past and what's worked and so what sort of tips can you give us? Okay. I would okay, I'd start that one a little bit differently because this somebody's trying to build it. Like, let's get to the root of the question, right? Which we don't know. That'd be great to open up a line. Like, you know, she's not here. But I know that, you know, if we get – what we're really looking for here are coaching clients. That's why we want to build the relationship with the chamber. So let's just make sure we're addressing what we want to be addressing. Um, there's a concept we teach buying coaching clients, okay? You, the same way that if you go to 7-Eleven and you want bread and milk, you don't walk in and say, hey, my family's at home. I think they're going to like this bread and I think they're going to like this milk. So let's do this. Let me take it home. Um, and I should be able to be back within an hour. If I can't do that, look, I'll come tomorrow morning. No problem. But it's, you know, it's $5.80. I'll bring the money in tomorrow. Okay, sound good. High five. Let's go. Does that, that work? What do you think the dude behind the counter is going to say? Like he's literally going to laugh at you. Okay, it's not the way it works in the real world. The good news is, though, that we all understand that if we want bread and milk, we go to 7-Eleven, we go to the grocery store, we walk in, we hand them the money, and we will bring it home with 100% certainty. Okay, provided there is a, if you live in a small town and dirt roads and whatnot, you might have to drive a little bit further. But once again, with 100% certainty, every single person that will ever listen to this, every coach on the planet will be able to buy milk and bread. Buying coaching clients. How would you like to have 100% certainty that you could go get coaching clients without any question, without any shadow of a doubt, but you might have to drive a little bit further? Okay, so buying coaching clients. In fact, if you gave me $100,000 and asked me to build any business, you pick the niche. I don't care if it's my, a dentist practice, it's a chiropractic practice, it's a coaching business, it's selling toothpicks. I would go to this strategy right here. I would buy, actually, I'm going to replace that. I would buy ideal clients. And ideal clients is your target market. But imagine in the coaching world, these are people that can actually afford you. Okay? So let's go to that. So the chamber, understanding that concept, right? I'm going to buy coaching clients. So I go to the Chamber of Commerce. You're probably going to find that what I have found is that, I, and I've got lots of deals done with chambers over the years, but what I find is the guy who's the chairman of the board is a business coach too, okay? Or in a, in a competing kind of space, like a marketing guy. So as a rule, I have not had a lot of success going to the chairman of the board and having hit him put it in front of his people. Ultimately, these are nonprofits, and they've got, again, just the fact that they have a board means to be, needs to be put in front of them, lots of red tape. Red tape means the deal's probably not getting done, so I prefer to do it at about 100 
times the pace, which I'm going to explain how I do it, and you can all decide if this is a if this is what you want to do or any variation of. But what I do is I go to the top salespeople. Okay, the top salespeople are you know they are feet in the street. They're they're at the coal face, right? They're on the front lines with the clients. They're the ones selling the memberships. Who do you think decides when the speaking gigs are going to be? Who do you think decides um, you know who's going to be the speaker at the events, a lot of the time it falls on these folks and you're going to find there's not going to be that many salespeople and there's normally, you know, an absolute superstar. And she or he, look, they're making 30 grand a year. This is important, right? So they could be just super passionate with a rich husband or rich wife. That's fine. But I doubt that's the case highly. And they probably need to make an extra few bucks. So I go into the chamber. You got to do this with a little bit of charisma. Um, we talked about a little bit building rapport. If you do this too quickly, this will bite you firmly on the behind and not work. But I go in and I build a relationship with the gals of the guy um, selling the memberships, and particularly the head honcho. I talk a little bit about what I do, helping out. I can do speaking. I invite them out to um, lunch in some way, shape, or form. And frankly, and if it's a girl, again, or a, a, like, you know, if it's a guy, if it's a gal and I'm a if it's a gal and I'm a guy, I might want to be a little bit careful with looking like I'm trying to hit on her or something along those lines. Once again, super professional, mentioning my wife, that sort of stuff. Um, but the bottom line is I want to take her out to lunch and I want to talk a little bit about the chamber, successes, pitfalls. Look, if, here's a great question. If you were a small business, would you join the chamber? They're going to say yes or no. Then say, Why? The answer to those two questions is going to give you a tremendous amount of information, um, you know, inside this person's mind in terms of what they're thinking and whatnot, and how and how would you increase the value so that you would give that a definitive yes? Okay, again, understanding exactly what they're looking for. Bottom line, I build rapport. I take them out. I say, here's the scoop. I could build a relationship with the Chamber of Commerce. That can be kind of you know challenging. I prefer to build a relationship with you, right? Um, you're the one doing all the work. You're the one speaking to all these people. Here's what I do, um, you know, for a lot of other folks, social proof. I pay $1,000 per coaching client closed, which you may or may not be comfortable with. But ultimately, I don't have a relationship with the chamber. I don't think that they're going to have a relationship with me. I don't, I'm because reason is not because they won't, because I'm not going to take the time to go fill in 75 pages of you know, um, paperwork and put together a long, you know, a lengthy proposal because I'm just not worried about it. That I'm a very, very busy guy. Remember, everybody wants to work with the busy folks. So I say, look, I pay a thousand dollars per closed coaching client. If you feel like there's some people that are asking you marketing questions and asking you business building questions, and you feel like it would be handy to have somebody to throw them to instead of you having to try answer these questions and not really be sure what the heck the answer is. I'll make a deal with you. You send them off to me and I will pay you $1,000 up front for every one of the ones that close. But please do me a favor. What I'd like you to do is if you agree this is a great idea and you'll be able to tell by their body language at this stage if they think it's a great idea or the tonality and the questions that they're asking over the phone. And I say, look, here's what I will do. Um, if you think this is a good idea, what I want you to do is just sign me up three. I want to just do three to start off with because I want you to take me for a test drive and I want to prove that I am the real deal. I want to prove that I can really change these people's lives. Okay? So here's what we do. You pay me a thousand, I will pay you a thousand dollars per closed client. Only do three. Let's measure the results in six months. Make sure that you're over the moon satisfied and these people are thanking you nine ways to Sunday for introducing them um, to me. And again, and I will pay you a thousand dollars per person who comes. I would also like to do this, Lucy. We're going to call her Lucy. Lucy, I just I know how. Think of my my Seven Eleven experience, right? Here's what I want to do. I just I can tell that like you're comfortable, right? That you'll be able to at least send me three people because you get these marketing and business building questions all the time from the people buying a chamber membership, right? She says, "Yeah." I go, "I would like to pay you up front for the first one." Just the show of good faith and to show you that I'm serious and I'm not like some other folks that you may or may not have encountered in this business building world where they talk a good game and then never, nothing ever really happens. But I only want you to accept it if you're going to, you know, gentlemen's agreement's fine here. We'll just shake hands on it. 
Um, but provided you feel like you can send some folks to me, here's a thousand dollar check and let me just send it to you. And, and by the way, Lucy, the chamber is not going like I'm never going to tell the chamber about this relationship. I don't. If you want to tell the chamber about this relationship, you are more than free to do so. But there is no chance they'll ever hear it from me. It's completely up to you. So, and then Lucy either goes for it or she doesn't. I can tell you that the number of coaching clients that that closed for me would blow you away. This, and again, you but you need to tread a little bit lightly here, guys. And once again, what you guys can and you know are and are not familiar with, they're comfortable with, what have you, you guys grab it and run with it. But I can just tell you that there is no, you know, like Lucy is her own person. When she walks out of that door, I mean, she has the ability to go and talk to people and help people, et cetera. So anyway, so that's the way I do it, man, right there. And it works with stupid consistency. Lucy normally sends me somebody and I have been ripped off. I have sent that $1,000 over and then all of a sudden, you know, she got fired for nothing to do with this, right? But, you know, she got fired or she quit or she got laid off or she got sick or her husband got sick and the $1,000 was lit on fire. She wanted to pay me back. She couldn't pay me back. It just was what it was. But the $1,000 that I got, that I smoked for, let's say, the $10,000 that I wrote, the other 9000 you know, made it. The 1,000, I don't even think about it. But buying coaching clients is what I want you to think about. That's the, this is the premise. And that is, you, you have to be willing to just walk in there and lead with, you know, I'm the same way that you buy at 7 Eleven. You can buy these coaching clients. You can do it in other ways. If you have a membership site, you could give away memberships to your site as current. Because think about money is ultimately currency. You've got your time that you could give them. You could go and help them move their house. You've got their expertise where you could help them build a marketing plan free of charge. This is you providing currency. You've got hard money that you whip out of your wallet and hand over. You've also got things like if you have a membership site and let's say you charge $500 a month, that's six grand a year. And you give her five memberships to give away for free. That's $30,000 of value that you're able to give to her or him, um, you know what I mean? To be able to exchange currency, to exchange value. That could, that's similar to a way of coaching, coaching, um, of buying coaching clients. And Tony Robbins, if you're wondering, gee, I wonder, this might work. I mean, Tony Robbins for years, he runs radio ads. Basically, you, you, um, log in. I think you had to pay a hundred bucks to the webinar. You'd go to the webinar. You would get a free, um, three weeks of free coaching. And then on the fourth call, they would schedule it and then they would sell you coaching at, you know, one to two thousand dollars a month on that fourth call. So the currency that they gave was the time and the expertise of coaching for three weeks. And then on the fourth call, there's a high level of rapport. You've done a bang up job and they convert it at an insane level. So that's the way they did it. Awesome. Awesome. Now, kind of in the same breath, because we're talking about JVs. What about, um, what about accountants and CPAs? Okay. So, okay. Now I was just, okay. So really what we're talking about here are joint ventures, right? Similar to the chamber, but quite frankly, I, I take a very different approach. Okay. So once again, what we're trying to do are get clients, right? Nobody wants a joint venture with an accountant. What they want to do is find a way to get the accountant to recommend them so that they've got, you know, 50 coaching clients falling off a log per year. Okay. So what I do, so, the accountant is going to operate. It's all about entering the conversation going on inside the prospect's head. And make no mistake about it, when you're trying to form a joint venture with an accountant, this is a prospect, right? This is not a, you know, this is, this is not the accountant. This is a guy who you're trying to make a very high level sale for. I find that folks approach joint ventures like, like they're insulted that the accountant doesn't call them back. But then they don't get insulted when the coaching client they try to pitch at two grand a month don't call them back. Like it's the same thing, quite frankly, but times 10, right? So this is like a coaching sale on friggin' steroids. So you therefore should approach it as such. In other words, provide as much value as you possibly can. So here's how I do it with the accountant. I would interview a few of them so that this is coming from you than me. But I'm going to tell you what you're going to find out when you interview 10 accountants. The bane of their existence is that three months of the year, they are so busy, 
They are so tired because everybody comes to see them three months after the year is over. Okay, not exactly a high level of intelligence when you're doing that. They go see the accountant three months after the year is over, and then they've got this mad rush where they have 90 days to get their, you know, to get their taxes in, stay compliant, get all this done. But everybody else is doing the exact same thing with the accountant. So what do you think the accountant's phone sounds like? What do you think his inbox look like? What do you think the demands on his time look like? It, it literally, you ask an accountant, it ages them, right? It literally ages them. So, it, and by the way, you, you find out, you speak to the accountant and make sure this is his particular hot button. There will be accountants that that isn't. I'm going to tell you this is a solid eight and a half out of 10. So if you agree that that's the problem, what you do is I would go to the accountant. This is what I do. We actually run a program where we help you. We teach you how to form a joint venture with an accountant. And we're so confident in the program, we actually closed two joint venture relationship with accountants for you. Okay, just to put it, whether trying to frame this as to whether or not we think it actually works. Literally have a program where we close two coaching relationships, uh, joint venture relationships with accountants for you as a coach, right? We have lots of accountants that work with us. So basically, um, here's the pitch to the accountant. Once again, they're very timid. They're very analytical on average, okay? So approach it in that manner. So I say to the accountant, look, First of all, I want you to take me for, there would be building rapport long before this, okay? So now I say, and Road Dog, you're the accountant. So Road Dog, here's the scoop. Um, here's what I want to do. I don't want you to send me every person you ever met. I don't want you to send an email to your entire database of 3,000 people. What I want you to do is take me for a test drive, okay? I have the capacity to change things in a very big, bad way. I know that we've just talked about it, but your number one challenge is the fact that these people come to see you three months after the year is over. I want you to send me three coaching clients, okay? Those three coaching clients, I am personally going to guarantee that they will not be part of that log jam that, log jam that you talked about earlier, okay? To the point where if I have to go and pick them up in my car and drive them into your office at least twice, because they will come to see you at least twice a year during the year, Right? They, they will not come to see you after the year is over. During the year, and this is going to allow you to do what you like to do, and that's to get a little bit creative, a little bit smarter um, with their books, help them at a really high level. So they're going to come to see you two times during the year. And if you like it, and like I said, I will personally guarantee it with those three, because you see Mr. Accountant or Road Dog, if I'm working with these guys, if I can't see the scoreboard, how can I possibly coach these guys at the highest level? Right. So I've got to be able to see their numbers. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Right. So that's what I'm going to do. And by the way, Road Dog, your fees are probably you said they're about twenty five hundred dollars a year for your average client. Well, when they come in to see you two times a year during the year, your fees are now going to increase. And by the way, in many cases, I'm going to get them to come to see you four times a year, possibly even as many ten times a year, because we both know how absolutely critical it is that they are watching their financials, they're watching the scoreboard um, to manage their business. So their fees are going to go from like 2500 to five grand, possibly plus. But you're going to save them so much money in tax, and they're going to be getting so much more value from you and with their numbers that it is going to be worth it, and they are not going to bat an eyelid. You agree to it, but understand. So no, and now, so that that's it. And then I throw it to your road dog, and you give me a yay or you give me a nay, and there might be an objection that I need to overcome. But at the end of the day, I'm like, Road Dog, just tell you what. Let's, let's instead of me giving you the answer, set me up with one to three of these clients and let me prove myself over the next six months, right? But you basically what I'm doing is I'm solving that major problem. But you are going to sign up. You're going to send me those three. And then you're looking at your other 300 business clients. And guess what you're going to be thinking about in six months' time? Shoot, I got to get every one of these guys underneath Carl because this is working like magic. And you are going to be making more money. What we do, what I don't do, Road Dog, is I don't go in and say, hey, man, you know what I'm going to do? You send me the coaching clients. I charge um, a grand a month. I'm going to pay you 25% of that thousand. So every every coaching client that you provide me, I will pay you 250 of my thousand. 
I will start paying you when they start paying me. And when they stop paying me, I'm going to stop paying you. How's that sound? Right? My daughter that runs the lemonade stand could work out that that's probably not the most exciting value proposition for the accountant. Right? He's got a lot to lose here. What if you do a horrific job? What the accountant wants is he wants his fees to increase. They're now twenty five hundred three grand per. He loves the idea of them being five to six thousand dollars per. So your twenty five percent is completely irrelevant to him. The thousand dollars up front's not going to excite him either. He doesn't want to have in fact there's a conflict of some of them will tell you there's a conflict of interest there. So they're not interested in, you know, having a you know a percentage of your fees. But that's yes. and then by the way, if you're selling advertising road dog, I would say to you, send me three clients and whatever their advertising budget is at this stage, I will help you double it. They're currently spending five grand a year. Over the next 12 months of me working with them, they will be spending 10 grand and be the happiest advertisers in your company. Because I know that people run ads and then the phone rings and then they have nothing interesting to say, nothing compelling to say, no upsells, no downsells, no cross sells, no upfront offers, no compelling messaging of any kind, um, no follow up camp, no, no follow up sequence either, and no call to action, right? As in the offer. So I am going to help you not just with the ads, but I'm going to help you with the process of the ads so they start becoming this incredible money making machine. That's what the guy who's selling advertising, when he goes to bed, he doesn't think about how we can make 25% of your coaching fees. He goes to bed and thinks, how the hell can I sell more advertising? That's how he makes money. Right. I like okay. the fact that even for the accountants, you're, we're, we're not talking the, 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 the referral fee or anything. Their currency is time. 100%. Right. That's, that's, their, that's the currency that they're looking for. And because again, and same with actually technically really the, the advertising guy too, if you can help free up more of his time, make, make his clients more profitable, he then has more time to go and make more sales. So very cool. And now kind of, kind of a last sort of question here as my heart rate comes back down to normal. Um, the vast majority of coaches, you and I both know, they're only making what, like 50 to 75K per year or something like that? Like, what, what yeah, do you think is the number one reason? Like, why is that? Why do most coaches struggle just to make a really good living? easy. This, this is consistency in a word. Okay. It, the, it's an apple a day, not seven apples on Sunday. Okay. It's an apple a day. You have got, if, if I talk to a coach and they're not making the money or they're in a little bit of a crisis, I will just tell them, have a look at your calendar of the last 30 days. Show me how much lead generation was going on. And invariably, it's like a, you know what I mean? It's very little to none. And this is always the problem. You have got, in fact, I would go as far to say, in fact, I sent out an email about this not too long ago, but they don't have, coaches don't have a um, money problem. They don't have a client problem. They have a, I refuse to help you until you start paying me problem. That's the problem, right? So once you address that, so in, in the email, basically what I said, and by the way, if I spoke to you, this is what I would say. I'd say, look, if you picked up the phone every single day, okay, and you helped three people with absolutely zero zip, and I mean this in your soul, in your heart, when you phone, you have no expectation of getting them to buy from you. You were just phoning to solve a problem, okay? Every day, three people, okay? Day one might be very unexciting. Day two might be very unexciting. In fact, you might be, it might be unexciting for the entire first month. As you went along, I would highly doubt that, by the way, but let's assume that you're horrific at this and we're starting from below bottom. What would happen is some people would start, they would refer to, you know I mean? They would refer people to you. They would start questioning, hey, and by the way, you should follow up this with it, this with an email. So now you've got, their email address and got them on your list, by the way, it would be incredibly handy. That could be the one thing that you do look to get out of that conversation is, hey, can I send you a follow-up email on this to see how you're going in 30 days? Bingo, bango, bongo, right? But at the end of the day, you're going to pick up the phone for, thir for you know, we're going to do this for 90 days, but at the end of 30, let's say you totally make a meal of it. After that, I assure you that people will start reaching out. People will start getting referred. People will start asking you to come speak at their events. People will start helping, asking you to solve their 
wives, their husbands, their childrens, their fellow business owners, their colleagues, their suppliers as business problems, and just good things would happen. Okay, and it's just it's what Eben Pagan refers to as moving the free line, which frankly I really I love that expression. But he just meant by that he in Eben Pagan, you may or may not have heard of him, heavyweight internet marketer, um, really smooth guy. I kind of like him for the simple reason that he's like he just he comes across. I mean, he says this right, but he's a bit of a nerdy dude. He's not going to be found guilty of you know what I mean, like you know being the most flamboyant and entertaining man of all time. It's just not his style, but. With that being said, he says, you know, I'm not a gifted salesperson, so therefore I had to find a way to make all this work. And what he does is he provides so much value up front before you pay him, it's almost like you've, you're guilted into paying him once you're done because you're like, oh my gosh, this was that amazing, right? So that's what he means by moving the free line. So in other words, if you think about it, in a traditional internet marketing launch, what you'll see is they've got three um, videos, and then the fourth one is to close you, okay? So they say opening the cart in the internet marketing world. So if you just watch those three videos and don't buy anything and just actually implement what was taught, because they were absolutely educational, just, you know, follow what, what was taught in those first three videos, you'd be blown away at how much value you'd get, right? So it's just, it's the rule of reciprocity. The same way, like at Christmas time, when somebody sends you a small gift and a Christmas card, first of all, just think about how beautiful it is when you go to the post box and there's a little box and an unexpected surprise from somebody, you know what I mean, that you care about and that they care enough about you to actually take the time to send you this gift for Christmas. Like, it's just, it feels so great, right? It's like, what an amazing person, right? And basically, it's just, it, it will come back in spades. And if you just follow it, but you, you've got to phone or you've got to do it with the rule of reciprocity. Actually, here's a beauty. My daughter with the lemonade stand, this is actually, here's one of the things we did. Some people don't have money on them. Okay. The deal is, but you could you imagine how many people, you know, flipped her, you know, like it's a buck and they gave her two and said, keep the change. So what we did is we had a pro bono program where anybody that wanted a lemonade a cookie or a brownie, but they didn't have any money on them. She gave one for free, right? Why? I said, baby, it just the reason why is believe me, it's going to come back in spades. Okay. Well, one of the gals left and she went to get money and brought her five bucks for her one dollar lemonade, by the way, and insisted and refused. We, you know, she tried. No, no, no. You know what I mean? I'm like, look, no, that's not. This wasn't the idea of the pro bono program, right? Like, but she. Gave her five bucks. You end up getting a four dollar tip, right? Could you imagine as people are moving down the street? Oh, you gotta buy lemonade from the girls down the end. They're so cute and so sweet. I didn't have any money, and my son Sam wanted one, and she insisted that he have one for free, right? And but so rule of Brett, like it, it happened there. It will happen for you guys. Bottom line, don't think it's it's not a money problem. It's not a coaching client problem. It's a and I think there's a lot of training out there that leaves a little bit to be desired. Like one of the things that we train our coaches is how to find anybody a hundred thousand dollars in 45 minutes without them spending a dollar on marketing or advertising. So, you know, it's systemized to the tilt. You just sit with anybody. And by the way, and the guys who work with us, they'll tell you, right, that you don't find somebody a hundred thousand dollars in 45 minutes. You'll find you have to water down the numbers because the numbers go too big, too quick. And it actually comes a little bit unbelievable. But the reality is that's the money that people are leaving on the table on average. Like it's crazy the opportunities that they're foregoing, right? So, so rule of um, reciprocity though is is a big one. You have a refusal to help people prior to getting paid. The solution is just pick up the phone. So then let's talk strategy. Okay, that sounds good, Carl. I'll help anybody. Who the hell am I going to help? Like I don't want to sound like a dickhead. I don't want to sound like an idiot picking up the phone. Well, go collect marketing pieces of all shapes and sizes, okay? Spend an entire day, two days, scouring the area and, you know, surrounding cities and collect as much marketing material as, as possible. That is magic because when somebody's bought an ad, they've paid for promotion, they basically are telling you, I'm looking for clients and I'm willing to spend money to get them. This is a good prospect or perspective um, coaching client. So, you phone them, and then something to the effect of, in fact, I literally provided a script in one of the emails, but something to the effect of, 
my mentor and just fill in my name with somebody else's, fill in our magazine's name with somebody else's. It's fine. Just the premise of it is I I made a um, a deal with my mentor, Carl Bryan, the editor-in-chief of the Six Figure Coach magazine. It's an international publication that you may have heard of. Of course, they'd never heard of it. That just sounds good, right? I'll continue. So I made a deal with him that I was going to phone a business owner today and solve a problem with absolutely no expectation of anything. So I don't want you to feel like I'm here to sell you anything. I'm just, I'm basically a business coach, highly successful, and we're trying to teach some of our other coaches, um, I don't know, the rule of reciprocity, how to give back, et cetera. But here's my question for you. I don't know how much time you have. We can do a follow-up. We can do this tomorrow. I'd like to know the number one challenge that you're currently facing in your business. By the way, I saw your ad in the XYZ publication. Great job. I could massively improve that. But really what I'd like to know is what's the number one problem that you currently face in your business? And I would like to know, I would like the honor of being able to help you solve that problem because I categorically, without question, almost guarantee that I can help you either solve that problem or drastically minimize it. And I would just like to do it as a um, as a gift. And again, it's fulfilling. You'll be helping me out because it'd be fulfilling a deal that I made with my um, with my mentor. And I know you're probably thinking, why the hell did he call me? Honestly, I really can't tell you why. I just I got this newspaper and I flipped through it and I just decided one of the ads would grab my attention. That's the person that I would phone, and that's you. So, Lucy, I would be honored to be able to assist you in helping you with the largest, the biggest problem that you have currently. What is it? That's a little bit elongated. You get the idea. What do you think? What do you think she's going to say? I'll tell you one thing she's not going to say is F off, right? Right. I'll tell you, she's probably going to say is, that's so cool. No one's ever, I've I've got over 10,000 phone calls on the stupid phone. I look at this phone and I every once in a while think of throwing it in the ocean because I'm so sick of it and it drives me nuts and everybody's trying to sell me crap and you just phoned me with a gift to ask me to help. You are a special human being. Kudos to you. And I'll tell you what, here's my biggest problem. I would love a little bit of assistance. I don't know. If you made three calls a day, not all of them are going to go like that. Tell you what, test it. Maybe I'm full of poo-poo. Maybe I'm out to lunch. Maybe it's going to work. But I'll tell you what will happen. In 90 days, you will be 10 times as good of a coach than you are today. Because this is the other challenge. Why don't coaches make more than fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars a year? Which, by the way, is horrific. If like you need, if you get ten clients at a thousand dollars a month, that's a hundred and twenty grand a year, right? If you make these phone calls, the problem is you're not picking up the phone. You're not helping anybody. You don't have lead generation going. You're not send out the same message through LinkedIn. Same out the same message through Facebook. Send out the same message through Instagram. What have you, right? Most of them are going to get ignored. Guess what? Just consistency. It's an apple a day. This is not going to take a long time. Once you get good at it, once you get busy, you hire a virtual assistant in the Philippines, and she can send out the messages. And then you could hire a telemarketer, and then they could make that call. We'd have to adjust the script a little bit, but hire a telemarketer. Great telemarketers can be like, you know, somebody with a a young child who can't get out of the house a great telemarketer, right? Because she's only got so many hours, but you could be totally flexible with this approach with the hours that she calls. Um, Somebody who's blind, okay? Help them start a little telemarketing business. They'll be loyal as heck. Somebody in a wheelchair who doesn't get in and out of their house as, as, you know what I mean, would be ideal. These are the, you help them build a little telemarketing company. They pick up the phone and make these calls every single day. And you could do these over the phone. You could do these at Starbucks, you know, just... Every day, you're going to meet three people at Starbucks, make them half-hour meetings and schedule them for an hour because they'll always run over, and you sit down with somebody and provide value at Starbucks, say, provided you buy the coffee would be a nice little effect. Jeff Kirkwood, one of our flagship clients from many, many years ago, the poor bugger um, passed away, but a fabulous human being, great, great man, so giving in nature that you never met anybody quite like him, quite frankly. He owned um, he owned B&I Australia and was the... Um, president of the National Speaker Association in um, in Australia for many years, but bottom line is that was his approach. You'd go to Starbucks, he'd solve any business problem you had. You had to buy him coffee. He solved the problem. What do you think they did at the end of the solving of the problem, at the end of the massive value? So how can I help you, Jeff? What else, how could we do this more often? Let me tell you how. And then he would basically, he had a membership site through us. 
he didn't do one-to-one coaching, very busy guy, very successful guy. He would just sell them a $2,000 uh, membership to his online academy. Boom. And it's all templated. No, no need for him to do anything. He just, you know, what's your name? What's your email address? Give me a password. Boom. Set him up. Or your password is going to be your name. So mine would be Carl Bryan. Boom. Plugs me in. Gives me a call in a few days. Hey, Carl, I just want to make sure you got your login. Did you go and check it out? Look, it's going to be totally life-changing, totally transformational. Follow every single one of those videos, word for word, step by step, chronological order. It's going to change your stinking life. If you have any questions as you move along, feel free to reach out, and I would too happily jump on the phone or have a uh, you know a spot coaching call with you to assist in once again solving any problem you have. Beautiful. In the rent. So if I don't know, Road Dog, what do you think? I love if a coach that. Follow that process. Would this work? So Ninety days. But it's an apple a day. They won't do anything, and then they'll try to make seven calls on Friday, which, by the way, would be better than nothing. But just make three phone calls every day, and they will improve at a level that would blow your mind. And I, the big, like, you've got to be better at what you do. Ultimately, you have to have the best product. The number one coach in your city, when I say number one coach, not in lead generation, in product, the number one coach that is at, like, the Tony Robbins of your city is never shy of a coaching client because he gets referrals. He's, you know, his fees have raised six times over X amount of time. He's, he's the opposite. He's trying to find ways to do group coaching and do group work because he can't keep up with all the one-to-one people coming at him. Create a better product. Get better at this. What I just described would work falling off a log for those in client. There you go, man. How'd that help? Or how'd that, go? that was awesome. This is in its simplicity, right? I think the biggest challenge that any coach will truly have is just coming across in that sincere way where it's like, don't look up. This is 100%. Like I want to do this for you it, without any sort of expectation um, at the end of it. So I think that's, that's amazing. So anyways, but um, we are, uh, if you can believe it, that was an hour. <laughs> so uh, any final words before we wrap this up and send everyone on their way today? That nobody, that is fantastic. You know, just, yeah, yeah, consistency and action. Just everything that I just outlined, do yourself, your kids, most importantly, those small business owners that would be answering that phone, do it for them. Their marriages are breaking up. Suicides are happening every single day over businesses failing. Marriages break up from lack of money over lack of love. You hear me constantly say that, and I will continue into the future because it is the truth. So when you phone these people, do it for that reason. Don't do it to fill your bank account. Do it to save somebody's family. Keep stepmom, you know, stepmommy and stepdaddy away from the family and keep the unit together. That's why you make these calls. The guy who tells you to F off and the chick who, you know, absolutely rails you, that's the person that needs you the most. Okay? Feel bad for them. Don't hang up the phone and cry into your pillow like, oh, boo-boo, poor me, poor me. No, no. That's the person who needs you the most send them an email and say, look, just, it's going to be okay. Okay. I know you're having a bad day. I have them too. Go from an empathy, right? Not sympathy, sympathy of you, sympathy and empathy. I think it's such a powerful lesson. Sympathy. If you're throwing up on a boat, okay. If I come and throw up with you, that is sympathy. Okay. Empathy is I get you a bucket, a glass of water and a blanket and I hold you. That's empathy. Okay, that's what these people need. They don't need you to throw up with them. Like that's why when I had a coach and they sit with somebody and the guy goes, I can't afford it. Well, when the coach doesn't hire his own coach, guess what? He buys into the bullshit. He actually believes them. Believe me, nobody can afford not to have a coach. LeBron James has a coach. This guy probably needs one. Michael Jordan had a coach. This guy probably needs one. Tiger Woods in his heyday had eight coaches. This guy probably needs one. You know what I mean? So, so that's what I would say. So just pick up the phone, send out messages, just go help somebody. It's not a coaching client problem. It's not a money problem. It is a refusal to help people before they pay you problem. I think that's such a powerful message. So that's all I got, Road Dog. Thanks, brother. Awesome, appreciate you, man. That was uh, always a Carl Ryan example of throwing up on boats. That's beautiful, buddy. <laughs> I that. Good way to start the I've week. Done that. Okay, thanks, buddy. Thanks so much, folks. Appreciate it. Have a great week, everybody. 
Carl Bryan built Profit Acceleration Software 2.0 to train business coaches how to find any small business owner more than $100,000 in 45 minutes without them spending an extra dollar on marketing or advertising. This becomes a business coach's superpower. So as a business coach, you'll never again have to worry about working with business owners that can't afford your high-end coaching fees. Check us out at Focused.com.